Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today I want to talk Schema Drift. That scenario where I'm expecting maybe 10 columns in an input data set, and I'm just getting this on a regular cadence, and then one day I get a load of different columns. I get 10 extra columns. I get one fewer column. Something changes in terms of the data that I receive. How do I deal with it? Now, Delta tables have got a load of stuff in there to deal with some of the minor schema drift. So we can say, well, actually, from now on, expect to have these three extra columns, four extra columns. And that just works. So I've kind of had a look at that kind of merge schema drift, the auto merge uh, schema overwrite settings. Lots of things you can do around that, which kind of like permanently changes your table. It says, yes, this new column, that's the state of things now. Change my table to expect that column. And that's not always the way that we're working. So there's an idea of uh, schema evolution, which is kind of one-off fluctuations. You know what? This time they sent me an extra 10 columns, but I don't want to have that always. I don't want future data sets to expect those 10 columns. Just put them somewhere and I'll deal with it later. Now, there's a bit of functionality that went into Databricks Runtime 7.6, which allowed you to do just this for JSON data using Autoloader. So it's kind of like sneaking in as a new bit of functionality, which is a great sneak peek into how people are going to handle like unpassed data, as they call it. Uh, and basically just saying a collection bucket form. Here is my fixed schema. And then just like anything else that came in, just put it over there and I'll figure out what to do with it. And that just makes a nice, stable, steady place for me to go and do some work. So that's what we're looking at. As always, do not forget to like and subscribe. And let us know down in the comments if you find this is useful, if this is how you'd want to see Schema Drift working, if you've got a different idea in your mind about how you would like it to work, let us know. Otherwise, on with the review. So let's have a look at this. So we've got this thing from the Databricks 7.6 uh, release notes, which is now out of beta, as is Databricks Runtime 8. So you can now use Spark 3.1 in production, fully supported. It is now generally available which is awesome, awesome news. There's even now Runtime 8.1, which I've not even thought about reviewing yet. We'll get to that, that's that's another issue. Okay, so this is the feature we're looking at. So we're looking at Schema Evolution using Autoloader specifically over JSON files. So it's, it's a fairly limited subset that we're starting with, but hopefully it's giving this uh, a pattern that then gets grown and can be applied to the places, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we've now got this, this thing. So we wanna use unpassed data column. So that's basically saying, which column inside my schema, inside my reference data set, should we put anything we don't understand? So if I'm giving it a JSON schema and it gets additional attributes that don't fit in that schema, where should it put them? And we're saying well, this should go into a field called unpassed data. So that's, that's the new bit. So let's go and have a look at what we've got. So I've got this product list original. It's actually just a real tiny little bit of JSON. Let's go and have a look in here. So I've got this product list original, a little bit of JSON, not too much in there. Kind of, it's got product IDs, name, color, list price, just as some JSON lines, nothing particularly exciting. So that is our starting file. Then on top of that, we've got the next file, increases it a little bit. We're gonna see size and weight. So it's like, that's like a major step change. Suddenly we're gonna, we've got some extra data we're expecting to see. And then finally, the next one up, we're gonna go and say, I just, want, I just wanna see a load of data. So we're getting much, much bigger, big, big step change. Some, importantly, some things in the middle of our existing one. So it's not just new fields appended to the end, it's kind of just, just any new attribute inside our JSON schema just going in there. So interesting stuff that we're trying to actually deal with at some point in our uh, flow. So that's, that's the idea. So we can go and build some scripts around it. Okay, so I've got a lake and I've kind of, uh, I did those extracts. I'm gonna create a new folder in here, which is we're gonna land the data after we've worked it. So let's go and have a quick look. I've got a cluster turned on. I'm using an 8.0 cluster because it's, because it's GA now, which is crazy. Um, and let's just dive and have a look. I've got this little JSON drift workbook. Okay, so things that we are doing. Firstly, I just quickly grabbed the JSON schema. Autoloader in this case is still expecting me to actually give it a schema. It still wants to be told, this is the data that I'm expecting, kind of so that it can measure drift against it. So in this case, I just took the existing schema and I'm passing that back in as a bit of JSON text. So I'm saying, so my expected schema is all of this good stuff. So I'm expecting color, list price, name, product ID. So that's kind of matching my product list original. 
Uh, and I'm just converting that to a struct type. So I'm saying, well, actually, from a bit JSON, make that into my schema. So I've now got this schema file that I'm going to go and work with. Now, using Autoloader, it needs a service principal that has to go and be able to connect and create an event grid um, subscription against the topic. It needs to be able to create a blob queue. It, it needs a load of access stuff. So I've saved all that secrets. That is all plumbed in. If you want to know how that works, I've done a video on setting up Autoloader previously. Go look at that. We're not going to go through it now. Um, and then I'm taking those secrets and I'm plumbing it into a little cloud file configuration map, which has got my subscription ID connection shrink. I'm telling it it's JSON in here. So if you're familiar with Autoloader, the actual format of the data reader, the data frame reader needs to be a cloud files format. And then within my config, I say, and this is the actual file format we're expecting. So it's expecting some JSON. I'm going to go through, I'm going to pass in the blob connection key so it knows how to connect to stuff. And then we can set up our data frame. So this is now taking that info. It's taking that schema. It's taking my config options and it's just pulling out that list of stuff. Now I'm not going to turn on that on pass data yet. Let's have a quick look at things first. In fact, let's, um, before I do anything, uh, what we can just do is a dear, um, let's just do a display. And that's going to go away. It's going to do a quick query over. It's going to show me what the data currently looks like inside that product lists. Now, again, we've just got the original file in there. So I'm expecting it to be real basic. Just show me a couple handful of records in that original structure. So starting off, that's what we're expecting to see. And there should be no surprises there. It does meet that schema. There's no schema drift. It's it's fairly straightforward. Uh, mm -mm. Let's kind of think about things. And then it should eventually show us some data. And then after that, we could start dropping some new files in there and we could say, what's it going to do? Okay, so there we go. So we've got six records. They fit the schema currently. There's no surprises in there. It's fine. Now, if we actually go back over to our landing area and we want to upload some files, I've done it previously. So I'm going to take this uh, JSON in there. I'm going to upload that, add it to my new list. Now, actually, it's got, still got autoloader running. This should then, in a second, go and find that new file, add it to the list. I mean, I could hit cancel and kind of refresh it, but it's it's not doing anything particularly exciting. It's just going in and reading that same data out. Thinking about it, it's just all set to do it again. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of current state, right? It's currently taking my expected schema, this one all the way up here, these four known attributes. I'm looking for color, list price, name, and product ID, and I'm just kind of forcing that on top of anything I read. So even though that second file uploaded has a load of new attributes, they're just going to get chucked away. It's like, I'll ignore that. That doesn't fit what I'm looking for. So there we go. So I've got a load of new attributes. They fit the schema. I have no idea what's happening to those extra ones, and it'll be the same with that new column that I, uh, with the new file. So let's just go and do the final ones. Go and grab that, same as we did with the other ones. Throw that really big file in there. And then we'll come back and have a look at what, how we can do that better. Okay, so let's cancel that again. Now, I want to turn this option on. So we've got unparsed data column. So that's now saying the name of the column in my structure I want you to inject any unknown attributes into is unparsed data. Now, that's not a column in my structure currently. So if I go and redo that, if I rerun that, you see that doesn't change things. It hasn't added that file. So if you just turn that option on, you won't see anything. Nothing's going to happen. What we need to do is actually kind of lie to it and say, you know what? There's another column now. So it's going to amend our schema. I'm going to say there's this unpassed, is that unpassed data. I'm going mad. Unpassed data. Let's just copy and paste to make sure it's right. So we've got a new column that now matches what it's expecting, and that has to be a string. And we've updated the schema. So if I rerun my data frame now, it now has this extra string, and I've just lied to it. I've just said, ah, there's an extra column there. But importantly, that option is now going to say, this column sitting there, this dummy empty string column, is where you push that data to. Again, if you've used corrupt record, it's kind of the same thing. So if we now go and do the same, now remember I've got my three files in there now, what we should see is our structure as we expect it. So the known fixed structure of color, list, price, name, product ID, and then kind of just this bucket, this unparsed data. Here's my other stuff just thrown in there as an extra thing I can go and look at. 
And that's interesting. Super, super useful. Uh, there we go. So now I've got unpassed data. And you can see kind of it's got thumbnail photo in this giant thing. The earlier file we've got a weight and size. And we've got this other data that I can just go and deal with. So you can see with the, the ones that matched the schema perfectly, uh, we had some nulls in there. So you can see there from our original file. So it's good. We, we have, we've not thrown away our data, but we've not had to flux our schema. Our schema can now just be fixed forevermore and just get any kind of additional structure into that unpassed data column as we want. Anything that doesn't match the JSON schema that we give it can just go into that bucket. So if I just quickly take that and just kind of show you how useful that is, get rid of that. Just going to quickly run that as a streaming query. So we're going to say, oh, well, I want to write that stream down. I'm going to do it with Delta. I'm going to do trigger once. So rather than have it as an open, continuously running streaming query, it's just going to do it once, grab that data, add it into a new location. I've given it a checkpoint folder, which now means I can just, I can run this whenever and it'll pick up any new files and only new files that have gone in since. Uh, and I'm saying this is where I want you to go and write the data to. So this is basically just rather than doing that display and having to deal with it as a streaming query, I'm just landing the data so I can then query it as a as a little batch once it's done. Give that a second to go and run. Uh, always like a little bit of stream query checking once it's finished, just so we can then check it, make sure how many files it loaded, how many rows went through. There we go. So we can see I've had 60 rows uh, gone through. My batch has completed successfully. That's now all finished. That's good. And then uh, let's look at how we actually use it. So let's do, I'm going to grab that location. So if I do uh, my new data frame is spark to read. Um, and actually I'm going to do something cheeky here and just go straight to the location. Now you might be looking at going, oh, how does it know what it is? Um, big thing, because I'm using runtime eight, Delta is now the default format. So without me having to tell it, it can read a Delta file and it kind of knows what it is. I've got my history in there. Now, would I ever build anything that doesn't actually have the, the file format encoded into it? No, but it gives you a little bit of a, a idea what it looks like. And actually off the back of that, I'm just going to do a create or replace temp view. Uh, so that we can then just write a quick SQL query against it, really. I just call that product. Okay, so I'm going to use this thing. JSON tuple is how we can uh, work with it. So if I say this is now a SQL um, cell, we can do select star from product. And that, as you saw in the results, should give us that straightforward uh, view of that data. And then spoilers, you can see I had that kind of JSON tuple uh, command in there. That's how we can interact um, with that JSON string. So essentially, that is just now a string column, which just, yeah, if you can pass it, it's got JSON in there. But it might as well just be any string uh, according to anyone looking at it. We can't do dot notation. So we can't say um, unpassed data dot wait. It's not going to work. It's like, that's a string. I don't know how that works. Um, but what we can do is this um, JSON tuple. Because I'm going from unpassed data and I want to take out something called wait. And I want to add that as a wait column. So it's going in there, it's reading it. If it found weight inside that impost data, it's bringing it in. If it didn't, it's showing me nulls. So actually, I can now just dynamically, so I can say, let's do my proper thing. It's going to be my, I've uh, forgotten the names of my other columns. I'm just going to do selector. <laughs> we can now actually dynamically go back and essentially just rummage in that bucket of potential data for unpassed data, going, anything that I had a weight, just bring it in. If it didn't have it, I don't care. It's fine. I, uh, you know, we, we can then sort of, you know, downstream in our lake, use those as separate fields. Yeah, so we can say, well, actually, I want to do that. Bring back size. We can go and build that in. Ooh, only one allowed per. Ooh, interesting. So it looks like there is a bit of a limitation of how many things we can actually pull out of that bucket of data we've got inside there. So yeah, okay, maybe maybe we can't use it that flexibly. But even so, we can actually sort of we could take that on past data and blow it up. We can pull out several things at once. There's a few interesting things we can do to pull that out. But that for me fixes like huge problems in terms of schema drift. So not as super amazing flexible as potentially could be. Uh, we could potentially write something that just switches the entire thing over into a struct. 
uh, but then has its own dynamic issues. How many attributes do you have? What has attributes? What doesn't? But so, so useful for actually just capturing data. Going back to the reason why we are using lakes of, I just want to land data. I don't want to have to tell it a schema up front. I don't want to have to just have a really controlled, um, essentially, I don't, I don't want to have a data pipeline that can break. I don't want it to be fragile. I want to have it just so, yeah, it's always going to land. I don't care if you sent me extra stuff, just land it. It's cool. That might be useful. Keep the data. I'll go and look at it later. Uh, and that's what this gives us. Um, I'll be it. one or two things in terms of we'll have to figure out how we do it. If we wanted to, we could obviously just do that as um, as separate kind of uh, add columns, not rather than in the SQL land. It kind of makes sense. But so, so, so useful, that new unpassed data column. So yeah, that is what I wanted to go through today. Just talking about that as a concept. Uh, I've not actually tried to see if you can just do it over normal JSON batch loads rather than just an autoloader. But as a general idea, it's super, super useful. Now, my actually, I mean, I do a lot where I just land data as kind of just uh, delimited text and then apply a structure over to it so I can then use things like bad records to chuck rows out and go, no, you don't mean the structure, you don't mean the structure. Whereas actually, this is might be a good argument to just start landing things with JSON. It's not actually just saying, well, actually just put a structure down and I still get the chance to add structure and kind of check data types and do all that kind of stuff over the top. But it gives me the flexibility to go, if there's anything else, just, just put it over there. Just, just put, it, put it in that box and I'll worry about it later. And that is the whole point of using legs is the land data first, worry about structure later to give you that real flexibility and agility. So that is the new feature. That is Schema Drift using Autoloader via has to be Databricks Runtime 7.6 and got this whole concept of an unpassed data column. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you think that's useful, if you're going to use it, if you're sitting there going, why would I ever use that? Be good to know. Let me know down in the comments. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Cheers.